Hi friends, here's my recap of Watchtower Study Article 16. I am going to try to do this one a little differently. I know it's really hard for many of you to spend so much time in these magazines because of the lies and the deception and the trigger, but it's very important to get them recapped and get the to bring out the truth of scripture. So I'm going to try to do things a little differently today. Take a look and let me know at the end or in the comment section how you like it, okay? Here it is, friends. Continue appreciating the ransom. The preview promises to answer why Jesus suffered a cruel death. What does the word ransom mean? We need to first look at that. Down at the bottom from Webster's 1828 Dictionary, a ransom is the money or price paid for the redemption of a prisoner or slave or for goods captured by an enemy that which procures the release of a prisoner or captive and restores the one to liberty. So when a proper ransom is paid, friends, the prisoners are released, period, okay? The prisoner doesn't have to do anything further once they've been released. Now we're gonna jump to, on the right there, that's the last page of the article, okay? By the arrow. Watchtower says, because of the ransom, we can have a close relationship with Jehovah. Notice it doesn't say we have, we can have. But the Bible says that because of the ransom, we can have eternal life. Do you see that? John chapter 3, verse 16. Whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Watchtower also says because of the ransom, the works of the devil will be completely broken up. Notice what's underlined in Hebrews chapter 2, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. The devil was destroyed because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, friends. Watchtower also says that the earth will become a paradise. But Matthew 24 verse 35 says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Reve Revelation also talks about the earth passing away, friends. So in that last paragraph that I just read, paragraph 17, that's what this entire article relatively is about. So now that we have, the, now that we know what the end is all about, we can kind of skim through the middle and just focus on a few things. Take a look. So notice in paragraph two, it says, what is the ransom? When referred to in the Christian Greek scriptures, now we're gonna stop here. We've already read the definition of a ransom. We know what it means. Watchtower is gonna go into some nonsense about the ransom, but we don't even need to get into that. What I wanna focus on is the fact that they're calling it the Christian Greek scriptures. Notice there, friends, it's called the New Testament, translated out of the original Greek. Greek, do you see that there? Up at the top of the slide, friends, it's called the New Testament because a New Testament went into effect when Christ died. But Watchtower does not want you to know that, so they call it the, the Greek Scriptures. Look at Hebrews 9. What's underlined? He is the mediator of the New Testament. Verse 16, for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Think of a last will and testament, friends. Watchtower teaches that, I'm sorry, I'm watching my friend's dog. I don't know if you can see her in the picture. She's really cute. She makes a lot of noise. Anyway, Watchtower teaches that the new covenant is only between the governing body or the 144,000. I don't even really know what their teaching is these days, okay? But that's not true. You see, the entire New Testament talks about a new covenant, a new testament with humanity, with Christ as their mediator, okay? Let's get back to paragraph two. Down, uh, moving down in the box, it says, he thus becomes an eternal father to all those who exercise faith in the, faith in the ransom. This is just really ridiculous. They cite Isaiah 9, 6, okay? I'm going to read that. For unto us a child is born, unto us a sin is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Nowhere does Scripture say that he became the Eternal Father when he died. Nowhere, friends. 
He always was the eternal father. Isaiah 9, 6. The son is given and he shall be called the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. Let's keep going. Paragraph four says that Jesus dragged the stake to the place of the execution. But listen, Jesus didn't drag anything. Each one of the four gospel writers state that Jesus bore his cross. Look at there, it's in red. John 19, he bearing his cross. Look at the definition of to bear. Down at the bottom in red, it's from Webster's 1828 Dictionary. To support or sustain without sinking or yielding, to endure. It's a little different than dragging, huh? Notice the bottom of the picture. It says, think about all the mistreatment Jesus endured to provide the ransom for us. Why? Paragraph five says that Jesus was charged with blasphemy because he had no respect for God. The end of the paragraph says that Jesus hoped his father would spare him this humiliation. Where does scripture say that? Read John 10, 33 up there at the top. The Jews answered him saying, for a good work we stone thee not but for blasphemy and because that thou or you being a man makes thyself God. That is why Jesus was accused of blasphemy. Paragraph six leads the reader to believe that the Jews were under a special curse. You can read the rest of paragraph six to see the nonsense that they wrote. I'm not going to take the time to get into it because I probably could do a video only on this paragraph. Friends, Christ died for all humanity. We are all under the curse that occurred in the Garden of Eden. But they cite Galatians 3, 10, and 13. Notice I posted verses 10 through 14. Look what's in red, verse 11. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident for the just shall live by faith. Right there, it means that no man is justified or made right in the sight of God by the law, which was works. Verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So because no man is justified or made right in the sight of God by the law or through works, all of the working, the going out in service, letter writing, pioneering, Gilead school, missionary work, Bethel work, Kingdom Hall builds, all of that means nothing. All of the years I counted time, all of those years means nothing. All right, look at that there in the box. He was training Jesus for his future role as our high priest. I just love this golf, golfer looking guy. He looks like he's pl out playing golf, just laughing. He cracks me up, but this is such a joke. I don't even know what to say here, but the paragraph gal goes on to say, Jesus experienced how difficult it is to obey God and that he went through, you see that underlined wrenching emotional stress. They take you straight into paragraph eight where in the middle of that box it says can humans demonstrate godly devotion even when severely tested going through wrenching emotional distress you see what they're inferring that they're going to have to go through this and they always did i always thought about torture and they would the yearbooks would get into this graphic torture and that was my mindset and they're still doing it. It's absolutely awful. Look at the bottom of paragraph eight. Jesus maintained his integrity and proved Satan a liar. That's nonsense because Hebrews two tells us the devil was defeated because Jesus conquered death. John eight down at the bottom tells us that Satan didn't have to be proven to be a liar. He always was a liar. There was no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Paragraph 10 in the box, it says, when John wrote, if anyone does commit a sin, we have a helper with the father, Jesus Christ. Notice what the verse really says. First John two, 
My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is a propitiation for our sins, but not ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Look at the definition of advocate on the bottom right. What's underlined? One who pleads the cause of another in a court of civil law. Christ is our advocate, friends. He's like our lawyer pleading the cause for us. The role of an advocate has a clearly defined role, friends. Romans 6, down at the bottom, tells us that the wages of sin is death. But Christ, as our advocate, not helper, pleads the cause for us. He speaks for our rights like a lawyer. And what rights do we have? We're saved by grace through faith. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, that's our rights. So if the devil who's constantly accusing says, look at what she did, she just sinned. Jesus, our lawyer says, oh, but you know what? Remember what I did. Remember what I did on the cross. Remember, I'm the advocate for that child. The book of Isaiah says, our, right, our righteous works are like filthy rags. We could never be good enough. God is God. Christ, therefore, is our advocate. Doesn't that give you peace knowing that? And one more thing. 1 John 1, 9 says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sin and to cleanse us from it. So listen, friends, as Christ's followers, we're still going to sin. Now, do we want, but listen, we have the Holy Spirit convicting us of that sin as well. So do we want to go out and, and deliberately sin? No, we don't, because there's consequences for sin, right? If we want to go out and just, uh, I don't know, like booze it up and go and get drunk and all that, well, you know what? We could get in a car wreck. We could hurt somebody. We could get in a fight. There's consequences for that sin, all right? So listen, friends, when we do sin, we're commanded to confess our sins to God. Confession is, it's an agreement with God about how bad sin truly is. So when we sin and we're convicted of it by the Holy Spirit, we, Lord, forgive me, because we feel that conviction. So confession is basically our recognizing, I did this and I'm, I'm sorry, please forgive me for what I've done. We basically, we stand guilty before him with no argument and no justification of our own. But yet our advocate, Jesus Christ, our lawyer, stands in, steps up before the judge, and together they agree because we are in Christ, because we have put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and that they both agree that no further punishment is necessary. Jesus has already made sufficient payment to redeem us. That's what the ransom was, the payment for us. Watchtower doesn't want us to believe that. They just want us to believe that Jesus is a helper. Hmm? All right, back to the article. Paragraph 11. How can you show your thankfulness for the ransom? How about pray? Pray about it. Thank him directly. He's alive. He hears our prayers. But Watchtower now is going to go take the next, the next few paragraphs to tell us how to do that. Resist temptation to sin. How about paragraph 12? Love your brothers and sisters. Notice the picture description. Each brother resists a temptation. Don't look at inappropriate images. Don't smoke. Don't accept a bribe. How about paragraph 12? Love your brothers and sisters. Really? Just a few other things. Paragraph 13 talks about forgiving one another freely, even if anyone has a cause for constant, for complaint against us. Well, listen, friends, forgiving freely? What about disfellowshipping? I've simply wrote my letter of excommunication more than 30 years ago, and I've been shunned ever since. Paragraph 14, thank Jehovah for the ransom. In the box, if you've committed a serious sin, you will also need the help of the elders. Really? What's serious sin like smoking a cigarette? Where does the Bible say we need to consult the elders for sin? Christ paid the price for sin, friends. I just want to remind you Romans 7, 23, where Paul said, But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind 
and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death, the physical body he was meaning? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. What Paul was saying is, look, he's saved, right? He's a born, he was a born again Christian. He put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ so that he could be saved. The book of Colossians talks about the circumcision made without hands where God cuts, invisibly cuts the flesh away from the soul, separating the body from the soul which is saved. So what Paul is saying here, what I want to do, I don't, and what I don't want to do, I do. So this flesh, we live in this fallen world, we're still going to sin. Paul sinned and he called himself a wretched man because he still did things that he shouldn't do. But he says, who shall deliver me from the body, physical body of this death? The, the body is dying every day and we can't stop it, okay? But our soul is saved. We have eternal life because Christ was raised from the dead. Paul says, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord, for what he did for us. That's what thanking him for the ransom is all about. Loving your brothers and sisters is good and doing all the other nonsense they said was good, but come on. I mean, really, you know. All right, so then the article ends with focusing on death and suffering. They have to make sure they keep their readers in bondage. This is normal Watchtower custom. They recommend in the box there to, take, to make this topic a special study project. Really? They also at the bottom say that they deepen their gratitude for the ransom by attending the memorial of Jesus' death and by zealously inviting others to join us. Friends, do you know that John 6.53 said, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Did you know that? They're denying Jesus Christ through that ritual? Why not focus on the fact that he was resurrected so that we may live. 1 Corinthians 5.17 says, and if Christ be not raised from the dead, your faith is in vain and you're yet in your sins. Jesus was raised from the dead. He walked out of the tomb. That's what, that's why people are still following him 2000 years later. It was a gift, friends. Accept that gift today. Cry out to him. He'll save you. That's it for this study article. I hope I did not focus on what Watchtower had to say as much as I normally do. I'm going to try to do it this way moving forward. Anyway, friends, thanks so much for watching, and I hope you have a great day. Mm -hmm.